Shri Rajiv Gowda. Thank you, Vice Chairman, sir. So, as you know, it's not just budget season, it's also cricket season. And our finance minister, Mr. Jaitley, used to be president of the Delhi Cricket Association. If you wonder what his cricket qualifications are, sir, he is a master of spin. After this budget was announced, if you looked at the media coverage, you would have thought that this was the greatest budget since the historic 91 budget of Dr. Manmohan Singh. Sir, unfortunately, the reality is that at a very crucial juncture in India's economic history, Mr. Jaitley has dropped the ball. I am going to focus only on three, four institutional aspects of this budget because my senior colleagues have already talked about the slashing of social sector spending and numerous other dimensions. Let me start, start first with the banking sector. So this government's own economic survey has pointed out that there are numerous projects that are on hold that have been stalled for a variety of reasons and the amount of projects that are stalled works out to 8.8 .8 lakh crores. Sir, these are in danger of becoming NPAs on the balance sheets of various public sector banks. It was therefore ideally the right time for the finance minister to step in and find a way to get, this off, get these projects moving again, get these off the balance sheets of public sector banks. Then you would have seen a boost to GDP like never before. Instead of that, he has left the banking sector in the lurch. If you look at the amount of money that has been allocated for public sector banks, and you look a little carefully at the amounts involved, it turns out that all the finance minister has done is take the dividends that the government receives from public sector banks and give it, given it back to them on, on, on the, uh, you know, as a return. Essentially, it is just uh, you know, giving back what was already there. There is no new infusion of capital when the, the economic survey itself points out that public sector banks desperately need financial infusion. So I am not suggesting that these projects are stalled only because of malfeasance on the part of promoters. There are also ma ma macroeconomic factors. There are other factors that have affected India's economy in the last few years, which have ensured that you know, it could be clearances, it could be various other regulatory factors, as a result of which these projects have stalled. In such a context, the finance minister should have stepped forward and ensured that these kinds of projects are made to move again. What has happened? As I said, he has dropped the ball. So, the world of finance is beyond just government investment in public sector banks. There are numerous international markets, there are secondary markets for distressed debt, and I think our junior finance minister is fully aware of those sectors of the economy. Why can't we let the public sector banks get rid of some of those NPAs by selling them at a discount in these global markets? This is something that must be undertaken. And on strengthening banking institutions, we have Basel III norms, which our PSBs have to meet in the next few years. This would have been a beautiful time to infuse some of that funding because the, 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 the macroeconomic factors are wonderful. Oil prices have come down, inflation is down, there is a bonanza coming in from selling spectrum. So this is the time for the finance minister to have acted, and again, he has let us down. Talking of institutions, I would like to turn to the next point, sir. This has to do with the Reserve Bank of India. Already, our senior nominated colleague, Dr. Ashok Ganguly, has spoken about the need to protect the autonomy and integrity of the Reserve Bank of India. He and I have both served as directors on the central board, and we know from up front and close, we have seen how extraordinarily good that organization is in terms of maintaining its independence, its integrity. This time, we see that the finance ministry is undertaking a variety of measures that will impinge on the ability of the Reserve Bank of India to make autonomous decisions with respect to monetary policy. What you have is uh, a new arrangement to set an inflation target so far. And what is the arrangement? Basically, one year after the inflation target has been set, the RBI governor has to report to the government about why a target has been met or not met. <coughs> Sir, inflation is not a result only of, of monetary policy choices on the part of the RBI. 
Inflation is also affected by global macroeconomic factors, and it is especially affected by fiscal policy on the part of the government. Well, how the government chooses to spend, how the government chooses to tax. And if the government cannot maintain the commitments that it has made in the Fiscal Responsibility, Responsibility and Budget Management Act, you will find that one huge component of this partnership is collapsing, but you will blame the RBI governor. This is not the only arrangement which is potentially dangerous to the integrity of the RBI. You have a situation where a new monetary policy committee is going to be created. If the government backs it with its cronies rather than with experts, you will again see the RBI's in, uh, ability to do its job being affected. So, not only has this finance minister not met the finance uh, deficit targets, he has also gone ahead and instead of cooperating with the RBI in cutting inflation, he has gone ahead and created a pool of cesses which are going to be uh, fueling inflation, who are going to be massively regressive and affect the common man. Uh, the RBI governor, the day after the budget, cut the interest rates purely as a preemptive move because there will be inflation afterwards and he will have no room to make any moves of that sort later on. So, I have one or two more points and if you look, I had more time allotted to me and uh, let me talk about another institutional framework, sir. This has you to were do. allotted 10 minutes, but you know, you, uh, the other members have taken more time, so now they have to be cut You, you can see that I have been extremely disciplined in yeah, the way I am. I just wish on. the finance minister were this please disciplined with the way he runs our country's finances, sir. Anyway, sir, on the issue of entrepreneurship, there's another institutional dimension. You know, sir, that there is... Uh, the uh, finance minister in his previous budget announced 10,000 crores for startup companies. There is another SETU fund right now. Now, this is a domain where high risk is the norm. You invest in 100 companies, one or two may succeed. How in a government environment can you go and co meet a controller and auditor general and justify this kind of investment in companies that are not likely to succeed? You have to make sure that the government steps back works with the institutional arrangement of venture capitalists and private equity players and ensures that the startup environment is facilitated without necessarily getting into direct government uh, allocation of expenditure or investment because that can result in all kinds of scams. So I'll move on to one other institutional dimension. This has to do with the ability of states, the institutional capacity of states to deliver social welfare programs. The finance minister has jumped with joy at the 14th finance commission's allocation of resources, uh, you know, enhancement of resources to state governments because this has given him an opportunity to slash funding for a variety of social sectors. Uh, sectors. This is essentially, uh, uh, he says, cooperative federalism and that this is going to ensure that states will do the job. So the capacity of states is very uneven to do this job. Already development is uneven. You have a situation where numerous states will end up worse in terms of uh, equity when it comes to social sector and other such funding. So this is something that the finance minister has to pay attention to and the new Niti Aayog has to. So I'll come to my last point. So you know that the finance minister was in hospital recently. I was wondering why. It turns out that he has had a heart transplant. You come and discover that the finance minister is now talking uh, one second. Please listen to what I have to say, Jayaji. You have to listen to. Madam, madam, he is, he is just a pun. It's not, he never had a heart uh, attack. So, 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 so that's why he is, he is, he is talking about something. Jayaji, please okay. listen to okay. me and then make your judgment. Just make your judgment after that. That's all I ask. So, he has developed a new heart for the poor, for the dispossessed, for the tribal. He has had a change of heart when it comes to obstruction inside parliament. And so that is what we see. And now that new heart has also given him courage. It's he has reju had the courage. rejuvenated, no? Sir? Rejuvenated. rejuvenated. Yeah, this is a, a figure of speech. And the basic point the is poor. that new heart has given him courage to stand up to the prime minister and to support the NRIGA at a time when the prime minister had poo pooed it given his lack of concern for the poor, for the, uh, for the dispossessed, for those without basic income. I hope that this same courage will continue to allow the finance minister to improve his budgets in the future, to seize India's economic opportunities and ensure that 
this that he serves as a conscience keeper for this government on the issue of social sector spending and 